Hi guys, welcome back to Car UK and to this video. Now in this video today, we're gonna to have a look at what is available in the small car world for under £1,000 here in the UK. Now, we're gonna have a look through Auto Trader, go through and see what we can find for under £1,000. Using my knowledge as a car dealer and an MOT tester for many years, I can go through the list and see which vehicles I would recommend that you would look to buy. Which ones have the problems, which ones have the faults, which ones are good, which ones are bad. Whatever it is, we can go through it and have a look and see what I'd recommend in the small car sector. So let's have a look through the Auto Trader now, see what's under £1,000 and see what we could potentially buy. Right, so we've got ourselves on Auto Trader. Let's have a look and see what we can find. So we're going to go on a national search and we're going to cap it obviously at a thousand pounds. Then we've got 1,060 cars up for grabs. We're going to sort of wean this down a little bit. Now what I'm going to do first is cap the uh, CC limit, so the engine size, to 1.4 litres. The reason for that is we're going to look at small cars today. And pretty much, when you're looking at small cars, you're looking really at smaller engine sizes. I know, obviously, there'll be an occasion where you might get the odd diesel, maybe a 1.6 that'll come into a small car. But I think 1.4 would be a fair place to cap it, because it's going to get us pretty much all the small cars that we're sort of looking for and would recommend. And there'll be one or two diesels in there anyway. Okay, so let's start training the list and have a look and see what we can see. Now, bear in mind, guys, we're going to dismiss the oddball car stuff that might be spares or repairs, high mileage or category stuff that otherwise wouldn't be under a £1,000. We're only interested in stuff that I know is readily available, but you could actually go and physically go and buy for this sort of price under a £1,000. First thing we're going to see is this, the Honda Jazz. Now, the Honda Jazz ran from 2002 to 2008. It came in 1.2 and a 1.4 petrol engine. Look at this one now, it's at £950. This, sort of, this is the sort of age you're going to be looking at uh, for this budget. So you're going to be looking at 03s, 04 plates, stuff like that. You might get the odd 05 or 06 if you're lucky with maybe higher mileage. Now, engine-wise, they're actually very, very good. I've seen these with really big mileage on, and they'll do it no problem. Um, however, they do have a few issues. Mainly, the main one is uh, the gearbox, and the secondly one is the corrosion. Something that we've noticed on the channel before. Uh, I bought a Honda Jazz recently that was absolutely rotten as a pair. And I've tailed a lot of them over the years as well for corrosion, particularly at the back end of the vehicle. So where the arch line meets here and the, and the boot floor, they can rot quite badly there. So you have to be web careful. This one, as you can already see, has already been had a bit of corrosion on there and someone's tried cocking it up if you like a bit of paint. Uh, that's looking a bit suspect already. This is the problems you're going to have at this sort of level. They are, unfortunately, just really bad for rot. Uh, and I probably would not recommend one at this price point. I'm not saying the Honda Jazz is a bad car. It's actually a really good car and drives really nice. But... For this sort of price bracket, you're going to get something that's pretty much on its last legs, and I really wouldn't be recommending it. On top of that as well, they've got gearbox faults, they suffer with whiny gearboxes, and if you get one with a noisy box, it can cost sort of six, seven hundred pounds to have it fixed. So it's probably not something that I'd recommend. However, if you found a nice one, then great. But at this price level, you're going to probably be you're probably going to be buying a pup, and I wouldn't recommend buying one. Moving on to a car that I definitely would buy would be the Renault Clio. Now, this is a Renault Clio 2, but called a Phase 3. So, started from about 2002 and went up to about 2008. They did change them very slightly at about 2006 mark. Uh, they came what's called the Clio Campus. Basically, it was a slightly different front end and they flushed off the rear tailgate and made it a bit more, more attractive and modern. But it doesn't matter which one you buy, they're both pretty much the same car. Now, this is a Clio 2. Early ones is a pre-campus. This is pretty much what you're going to be looking at at this price point. So you're going to be looking sort of between seven to £900. 03s, 4s, 05s, maybe the odd 06 plate or 56 or 07 if you're lucky. Engine-wise, you're going to be looking at a 1.2 petrol. They did do a couple of variations of that engine. I'll be looking to get what this one is, like a 75 brake horsepower, 1.2 16 valve model. The engines are very good. They don't usually give many too many problems. And I've seen them with quite big miles on, still going strong. Now, they actually drive really nice, the Clios. They're quite small and compact, 3 seats to park. And generally just an all-round decent car to drive. What to look out for on them? Uh, well, a few electrical issues. Obviously, it's a Renault. What do you expect? But, not, but to be honest with you, not that bad and sort of get overplayed a little bit. Uh, things that can go wrong. Hazard switches, they're quite common for going. Uh, but they're easy to replace. They usually just go a bit faulty. Uh, and back lights in particular. So, for instance, they can have problems where the lights come on. So, when you press the brake light, the indicator comes on or the fog light comes on. It's just basically an earthing fault on the back of the light clusters. It's very common. You can sort of clean 
clean them up usually, or worst case scenario, just change the light clusters and it usually solves the problem. I've had the odd one with a broken brake switch or brake pedal switch. So there's actually a little switch under the brake pedal that actually engages the stop lamps or the rear brake lights. Uh, they can go faulty as well and cause some problems. But that's pretty much really it. You might get the odd window that goes dodgy as well. But they actually are a decent car. The French can make decent cars, particularly small cars. And it's definitely something that I would recommend. Oh, one thing to point out as well, just notice this has got a sunroof. Um, I would definitely be checking sunroofs because they are quite prone to leaking on the Clio's. But needless to say, I would definitely recommend one. Uh, and one of the major reasons for that is, other than the fact they drive quite nice, is they are immensely safe. Remember, guys, these Clio's were four and five star MCAT safety ratings when they came out and have been ever since. If you're going to put yourself or a loved one in there, you're not going to get much safer than a Renault Clio at this price point. For MOTs, they were actually really, really good. We didn't fail that many of them, to be honest. They were actually a pretty decent vehicle when it came to the MOT test. When it comes to corrosion, they're very good. They're not really known as rock boxes. They're quite well put together. And the metal they used was pretty decent. I can only ever remember failing one in my life for sort of this phase Clio on corrosion. And it was only like one plate on the back and it was very minute. They generally hold up quite well and definitely something that I would recommend in buying. Something that I would definitely not recommend in buying is this, the Smart 4.4. Now, I know it looks quite an attractive car and a little bit different, and, you know, different sometimes can be interesting. And it is an interesting car, let's be fair. However, they are awful. Um, they don't drive very nice. I've never found a good one. At this price point, really is on its last legs, and they weren't great new either. Parts are an absolute nightmare to get hold of. They're just not a great car or great proposition at this price point. You want a cheap car that's going to be reliable, that's going to be cheap to fix and maintain and give you some good years of service. And I'm sorry, the Smart 4.4 is not in that category. Then absolutely should be avoided like the plague. Now, a car you definitely should be looking at is the Ford Fiesta. And this is the Mark V Fiesta, run from 2002 to 2008. Everyone knows the Fiesta and loves the Ford Fiesta. They've been around since, well, I think Noah. Uh, they've been a brilliant car and unfortunately just gone out of production, which I think was a bad move from Ford. But anyway, nonetheless, the Mark V Fiesta is a very good car. They drive really nice. The parts are cheap. Engine-wise are quite good. You'll be looking at a 1.25 ZTEC petrol or the 1.4. It doesn't matter which one you buy, to be honest, because there's very little difference between the two engines when it comes to fuel economy and performance. Probably the 1.4 may be a slightly better option all round, but the 1.25 is probably the most common you'll find. Both five-speed manuals, and both can do the mileages. I've seen these with 150, 60, 70,000 miles on, still going strong. With a little bit of maintenance, they will give you years of good service. The cars have always been quite attractive, especially if you get a later one like this 06 model with the sort of different headlights on. They still look a decent modern car. And if you get a five-door one, they're actually quite practical. What do you need to worry about on a Ford Fiesta? Well, not that much, to be honest with you. You can get the odd bit of corrosion on them, but they're not as bad as you think compared to some other Fords of years gone by. I have seen a few axles go on them where they've corroded. That can be quite common. We've actually seen one snap in half quite recently, but that was a very old car. They can go a bit scabby on the rear axles, so be careful. But probably at this age, probably okay. You're going to be looking at sort of 05, 06, 07 plates, and there's plenty of them out there. MOT wise as well, again, axle bushes are very common, so if you go and test drive one, go over some potholes and sleeping policemen. If you hear any sort of noise at the back end, it's probably the axle bushes. Bit of a pain to do, they're a bit iffy to get out, but they are doable, a few hundred pounds will put them right. Other than that, really, they're not that bad. And definitely a car that you should be considering buying at the under £1,000 price point. Now, I've noticed a couple of these actually, this is the previous Mark Fiesta, so this will be the Mark IV. These ran from 1996, I think, to about 2002. They did a facelift later on in the late 90s, early 2000s. Most of them are going to be like this, 02, 51 or wire edge, Fiesta finesses and flights and stuff like that. Engine wise, you had the 1.25 ZTEC and the 1.3 and they also did a 1.4 as well. Uh, I probably The most common ones we left now will be the 1.25 ZTEC or this Endura engine 1.3. This engine, to be honest, has been around since the dawn of time and was actually in also the Ford K8. It's not a bad engine, but it's very old-fashioned, being overhead valve. Of the two, I'd probably go for the 1.25 because it's just a little bit more forgiving. And the Enduri engine did have a few problems, with, particularly with burning oil. But if you can find a good one, it certainly will be reliable. Most Fords of this sort of era were. However, the main problem we're going to be of these type of Fiesta is corrosion. And this one's actually really clean. And to be honest with you, I think these are going to go up in value. So if you could actually get one of these quite clean and look after it, you might be able to actually earn a few quid out of it. and may not actually cost you a penny if you could look after it for a few years and maybe even then look to sell it on. Who knows? But I think they're definitely going to be a future classic. 
Again, MOT-wise, you're looking at corrosion issues, particularly on the arches and the sills at the bottom here. Um, also, axle bush is very common. That's the same issue you get on the Mark 5s as well. They can be common for going, but they can be easily fixed. They were a cracking car. They drove well and definitely something that I would consider. But obviously, just be careful. They are getting on a bit now. You're getting 20 years of age plus. You need to make sure you're checking them out thoroughly when buying one. But that isn't actually a really nice clean thing. I'm surprised that is still for sale for that money. Another car you could look at is the Fiat Punto, the Mark II Fiat Punto. Now, I know people don't like Fiats and you just come up with the saying, fix it again tomorrow. Yeah, fine, okay, fair enough. But to be honest with you, they're not as bad as what people make out. Now, I'm not suggesting you buy this one because it's going to look a bit scruffy, if I'm honest with you. There's probably better examples out there. But the Mark II Punto itself is actually not a bad car. Ran from about 2001 up to about 2006. And then it was replaced by the Grande Punto. I preferred the Mark II Punto. It just felt a bit more compact. It was easy to drive. Engine-wise, the most common was the 1.2 8-valve petrol. The fire engine, as we call it. It's been around for since about the 80s. Very good, capable engine. They did do a 16-valve version, which went quite well, actually. But they're not as common as you'd think. You're more likely to find a 1.2 8-valve like this one. They're quite practical. They came in 3-door and 5-door models. In series, they're always quite well put together. And they drove reasonably well. What goes wrong with them? Well, when you're buying one, the things you need to check, look at the steering situation here. Now, these have electric steering on them. Make sure when you start it up, it's functioning. You haven't got a steering light on. Turn the steering wheel fully locked to the left, fully locked to the right. Make sure you haven't got any warnings coming on after you've done that process. Also, as well, on this dash here, you'll have what's called a city mode button. Make sure that operates and functions, goes on and goes off. Basically, the electric motors can actually pack up on the column, and it'd be quite expensive to fix if you need one. It's going to fare a few hundred pounds to put right, so just bear that in mind when you're buying one. Also, as well, when it comes to MOT times, they can suffer a few little bits. Corrosion on sills can be quite common, particularly on the inner part of the sill where it meets the floor pan. So stick your head under and make sure you check under there as well, because they were quite common for going. Engines are pretty bulletproof, to be honest with you. Just make sure it's holding its water, fan kicks in, the usual things you would check on a car. And they can offer decent motoring, and the parts are not as dear as you think, with the exception, obviously, of the electric column motor. Staying on Fiat's briefly, you could look at a Fiat Panda. Now, you will find one of these under a grand mark. They're quite difficult to find, but they are out there, guys. Um, here's one we found here. Now, obviously, there's a category one, but we have found a couple of us under a grand still. This is basically a Mark II Punto like we've just seen here, but it's just slightly extended. So it's the same principle really, just checking the steering, make sure that's okay. But I don't know, the Panda just seems to have always been a very popular car. And even though it's just basically a Mark II Punto with a slightly higher roof, everyone seems to like them, and I do as well. I seem to have a bit of a soft spot for them. I've actually got one in stock now that I'm doing up, I'm going to put on the pitch, because I just seem to like it that much. But again, as we just explained, you just got to check the steering on and make sure that's okay. Also, I like the driving position. It's just better than the Punto Mark II because of the steering. You've got the gear stick there. The pedals are a bit, a bit better set up. Higher seats in, and they're just a nicer drive and definitely worth considering. They do drive really, really well and just so practical. Engines, again, will be a 1.1 or a 1.2, the same sort of Fiat Fire engine. They do do a diesel. A bit of damage on there. Look, probably why it's been written off. They do do a diesel 1.3. At this price point, I would not be buying a 1.3 diesel, um, purely because they're not the best of engines anyway, and at under a grand, it's probably going to be high mileage, and they are problematic as it is. You certainly won't be buying one at this price point. Just buy a petrol one. It'll give you years of good service, and again, I've seen these with big miles on still going strong, so that's definitely what I'd be looking at, and we could definitely look considering a Fiat. I would not be worried about buying one at all. Just notice this actually, uh, we've obviously just talked about the Renault Clio, this is a campus one, so this is a Mark II Phase 3, but the campus, um, again, like I said, just got a flush back on it, like we said before, that was an, it looks a cheap car actually for 695 quid, um, example there, a really good looking Clio, offers such good value for money, and you can get years of service out of that car, I just thought I'd show you that one as I was scrolling through the old trader. Moving on, I found this, the Kia Bacanto. Uh, the Kia Bacanto, well, it's not a bad car, but I wouldn't say it's a great car either. At this price point, you're going to be looking at a sort of a 05, 06, 07 plate model. They did facelift them later on, I think it was 08, 09. They did make them look a bit more modern, but at this sort of age, they just look a bit really dated. They were built to a price point. Um, they were about five or six grand new. Now, I'm not knocking it. You know, they are cheap cars. They are got cheap interiors. They don't drive that well. But again, they're built to a price point. So we can't really knock them for that. I just think there's better options out there. And this is quite a scruffy one, this. And certainly not worth 999 but I have driven many of them. They do sell. They're a perfectly good car. But they're just a bit old-fashioned and dated. The engines are not particularly anything great to write home about. They're not unreliable or anything. They're just not that particularly great fun to drive. 
And the reason why I don't like these so much is more to do with the gear system on it, the gear chains. They see they ran a sort of clutch cable system on them. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, clutch cables. We used to have them in the 80s and 90s. That's great. Old school. That's the way it should be. But honestly, guys, when you're looking at hydraulic modern clutches of today, go back and drive something that's got an old cable clutch and you'll realise why we don't bother using them anymore. The clutches are really feel horrible and feel really rough and taut. And in these, they just even when new and fitted with brand new clutches, and they just don't feel right. They just feel so outdated and fat, old fashioned. They're just not very pleasant to drive. It also doesn't help that they do suffer with stretch clutch cables and all sorts of clear box faults and stuff like that. So it's just not really a pleasant car that I would consider buying. I'd say probably I'd look at it's more of its rival. I would say if you're going to look at a Korean rival, I'd be looking at one of these, the Hyundai Get. There are loads and loads of these under a grand, and they're definitely worth considering. In fact, you've got so much choice here. I'd be going for a five-door rather than a three-door just for practicality, but if you don't need a five-door, just get the three-door. ULS compliant, look that one there, great. Um, they hold up the mileage, I've seen these with big miles on, still going strong. I'll have a quick look at this silver one there, this is a three-door one. 800 quid, a few little marks on it, but it'll give you a good service. 1.1 petrol and 1.3 petrol from memory. Interiors are quite well put together, I mean, they're fair enough a bit of wear on the gator there, but the actual plastics are quite solid and and well put together the engines are really super reliable but not that bad really i've had the odd one with a noisy gearbox so you've got to be careful of that make sure you go and test drive it if you get in it and if the noise has got a noisy gearbox in it just walk away like i said there's plenty of them to choose from corrosion wise they can suffer with a little bit of corrosion particularly on arches there you go there's one there with some rotten arches on so obviously be careful when looking at that because even though a real arch rust is not necessarily an MOT fail. If it produces a sharp edge, it can be. And you don't really want to be driving around with a car with low rusty wings on it. It just gives that bad image. Like I said, there's plenty of them out there. So you should be able to find one in budget. MOT wise are not too bad. Um, Subframes, I've seen a few rot on them. But they're easily replaceable. You can pick them up for not much of money. They're just an all around decent car. And like I said, I've seen these with 180 to 200,000 miles on still going strong. So I definitely consider them as a possible option. Now, a car you could be looking at, and I would recommend, would be the Volkswagen Polo. Of course, the old Germans know how to build a motor car, and the Polo is a prime example of that. Now, you're going to be looking at something quite old, to be fair, on this sort of budget. Um, we're going to be looking at sort of 02s, 03s, 04s. There's a good reason for that, because Volkswagen Polos hold the value so well. You want to go and buy a 58-plate Volkswagen Polo, you're going to be spending around two grand for it. That's how dear they are. But at this price point, we're looking at, like I said, 02s and 53s here. Engine-wise, you've got a couple of options. You've got the 1.2 petrol, which is a three-cylinder engine, and you've got the 1.4 petrol. The 1.4 is a four-cylinder. Now, the 1.4, 1.2 of the choice, I'd probably say if you can find a half-decent 1.4 petrol, I'd go for that. There's nothing necessarily wrong with the 1.2 when it, how it drives. They drive really, really well. But the 1.2 three-cylinder engine does suffer with a couple of issues. Predominantly, it does suffer with what's called burnt-out valves. So after a bit of use, they can basically the, the exhaust valves can basically burn out um, due to the fact they get quite hot and the plus the design of the valves weren't particularly very good. It affects cars from sort of early 2002 to about 2010. How you spot them? Well, start the car up. If it feels really shaky, just bear in mind it is three-cylinder, the 1.2, so it will have an unnatural unbalance. It might have a little bit of a vibration, but I'm talking about a quite a nasty shake at idle. Or when you drive it, it's got a bit of a misfire, or you've got an engine management light coming on. If you've got anything like that, guys, keep well away from the 1.2. But if you get one that is right, they are superb engines. They're really nippy, they're good on fuel, and they just drive absolutely superb. The Volkswagen Polo, like I said, this is an old 2002 plate. And look at this interior. I know it's a little bit dirty, but look at the quality of it. It's still holding up. Hardly any wear on it at all. They're just so well built. This is proper German engineering. The 1.4 petrol is probably going to give you less hassle, although it's not going to be as economical on fuel. But again, mileage-wise, look, 153,000 miles there. We've got another one there, 171,000 miles. They really can rack up the miles. So like I said, a couple of options there, the 1.2 or the 1.4. Four. They're a very decent smart car and definitely worth considering if you can find one in budget. MOT wise, not that bad to be honest. They're not really renowned as any rock boxes. I've seen the odd one with them rusty sills, but it's very rare to be honest. There's certainly a lot worse cars than these out there when it comes to corrosion. Major things I used to come across on them was wishbone bushes. Uh, they're quite common for going. The arms on them, the bushes, they can be prematurely go wrong, but they're very cheap to fix. Shockers can weep as well and get very soft. But again, very cheap to sort out. They're actually a really decent car and the parts are readily available. Definitely worth considering, guys. We want, That would be a car near the top of my list. Or you could go for its sister, the Seat Ibiza. Now, this is loosely based on a Volkswagen Polo, Seat, Skoda, Audi, all part of the Volkswagen Group. 
The engine wise, you'll be looking at a 1.4 or a 1.2, the same three cylinder engine we just talked about in the Polo. The same scenario goes for the 1.2 in the CIB fit than it is to the Polo. Make sure it's not got any engine lights on, make sure it's running right. If it isn't, walk away because you don't want to be buying one with burnt out valves. But also the 1.4 was quite common in the Seat Ibiza in 16 valve form in particular. They go quite well, they're quite a nice smart car and there's just something about Seats, they just always look really youthful. They're really fun to drive, they're well built and they're well worth considering. Now what else do you need to watch out for on them? Uh, arches I'd say on the Ibiza, they do suffer with really bad front arches going corroded on and going bubbling. I've had a few of these where I've had to change the wings on them, so that's quite cut. That's something that's quite specialist towards the Seat IB for itself. Not so much on the Polo, but the IB for does suffer with it quite badly. Everything else is definitely just related to the Polo. So, effectively, just like I said before, wishbone arm bushes can go on them, shock absorbers can weep and stuff like that. Basically, it's all the same structure underneath. But definitely worth considering. Absolute fantastic drive. And definitely should be on your list of a car to buy under a grand. Now, we'd have to mention Vauxhalls along the way here. We could look at the Corsa D or we could look at a Corsa C. I would definitely not be looking at a Corsa D under £1,000 because you're going to be buying a wreck. And they suffer with too many faults as well. Subframes can badly corrode on them. They just don't drive that nice. They're not particularly great drive anyway. If you're going to buy a Vauxhall this year, a Corsa, I'd probably go for a Corsa C. So... This is the course to see here, this is the shape before. These ran from about 2001 to 2006. And I actually think it was a better drive than its successor, the Corsa D. Now the Corsa C does suffer with a few issues. First thing you need to check is the interior. So get yourself inside, open the doors and have a look at the carpet. Get these mats up and put your hands on the carpet and you're looking for damp. They basically suffer with the cabins getting flooded and it comes from the front bulkhead here. So lift the bonnet up and you'll see on the bulkhead, it's actually got plastic covers on it which is a bit deceiving so you can't see it properly. But they get full of leaves and crap and basically block up all the waterways and it sort of falls over, goes behind the back of the dash and ends up on the carpets on the front floor. Now you can fix them, basically it's just a case of taking all the crap and water and mold it and algae outside of the bulkhead and then resealing it up where it leaks. So always make sure you check that, you make sure it's nice and dry in the footwell in the cabin. Steering systems and steering racks in particular are quite dodgy on them, so you want to be grabbing the steering wheel here, basically rocking the steering from side to side, so why when the car's standing still on a hard surface, on the tarmac, just rock the steering wheel side to side, and if you get any noises down here where the steering column goes into the floor basically, you're going to get noises from the U-joint or the steering rack itself. Very, very common on this year of vehicle for the steering rack or the column to get play, and it can cause a horrible banging noise. This can actually deteriorate quite quickly and eventually it will actually fail the MOT on excessive free play in the steering. So you need to make sure you're checking that guys. You should have no knocks or bangs at all when you turn the wheel side to side. Other than that, really corrosion wise they weren't that bad. The odd bit of welding here and there occasionally but honestly not that bad compared to some other cars out there. Engine wise, well where do we start with them? The 1 litre 1 1.2, timing chains are really noisy on them. They're quite common, start the engine up. Make sure it's nice and quiet. If you've got rattling when it starts up and then disappears, that's usually a sign that it changed on its way out. And when it gets warm as well, get it up to temperature. When the chains are starting to fail, when they get warm, that's when you'll hear them being really, really rattling and horrible. If you've got anything like that, it isn't the end of the world, you can replace them, but it's a few hundred pounds to put right. Also, check oil pressure switches under the bonnets. They're really common for leaking. And to be honest with you guys, if you buy one, the first thing I'd ever do on a Corsa, assuming the chain's all right on it, is make sure you service it properly, put a decent flush in it, get the oil out of it. You just seen stuff with really sludge oil in them. Get it serviced and change that oil pressure switch. Even if it looks that doesn't look that old, just change them. They're about five or six quid. But if that goes and you lose all your oil out of the car, believe me, you can lose about four litres of oil out of these things in about a matter of minutes if it fails, and they are really common for failing for the sake of a four or five pound switch. So just change them anyway. They are quite a nice car, and this one here is quite quite attractive looking thing. And actually, I don't think that's a bad car for the money. And it's definitely something worth considering. I wouldn't say it's top of my list, to be honest with you. I think there's better cars we've looked at already. But if you like a Corsa, I would say go for that. Don't go for the Corsa D. If you're going to spend £2,000, I get it. I know why Corsa Ds are popular and people like them. I sell them all the time. There's a good reason why people buy them. They are well liked. But at this price level, I would not be buying a Corsa D. I'd be looking at a Corsa C if you're going to go down that road. You could look at a Skoda Fabia. 2001 to 2006. 
petrols is probably what you're going to be looking at. The engine wise, if I remember rightly, they did a 1.2. The 1.2, unfortunately, is that engine you get in the Volkswagen Polo, as we mentioned earlier. So you need to be checking it again, make sure it's running okay. Burnt out valves can be common on them. Or you've got the 1.4. 1.4 is probably the one I would go for. The car is slightly heavier than the Polo, so the 1.4 is probably the one that I would like to buy. Very practical five door car, they're all five doors. They drive really well and offer decent reliability. For this sort of money, I mean, this is a 2001 plate, but you'll find ones for 53, 54 plates easily. If you're lucky enough to find a diesel one, that'd be great as well. They did a 1.9 standard diesel engine out of the Golf, non-turbo charge, and they also did the TDI versions as well. They also did a 1.4 diesel, but they are quite rare as hen's teeth. But if you do find one, they're actually a blast of drive, and that's super duper on fuel as well. Although they, don't, although, although they do sound like a tractor. But to be honest with you guys, the one you're going to come across is most likely to be the petrol models. MOT-wise, are pretty decent. Not too much issues, really. Again, same thing about them set of beefers and the same with the Polos. It's all Volkswagen ish underneath. So, again, shockers, wishbone arm bushes are quite common for going. That's pretty much it, really. They're not really rock boxes or anything like that. They're generally a half decent car and definitely worth considering. Now, you're probably wondering why I haven't mentioned this car already. Of course, the Toyota Igo, which is also the Peugeot 107 and also the Citroen C1. Of course, this has got to be top of the list, surely. This is probably the best small car that you can buy probably out there now on any budget. Well, hold your horses a minute. Now, there is no doubt that the Toyota Igo 107 and C1 drive amazing. They are brilliant. The engines are absolutely reliable as anything. One litre Daihatsu engine they use. They are superb. I've seen them with 200,000 miles on still going strong. They are bulletproof. They do deserve that title. They drive actually really nice. They're very nippy. The cars are really practical. They've got 20 pound road tax on them. What is not to like about the Igo and the 107C1? Well, at this age, you've got to be a little bit careful. Now, if I had a 2,000 pound budget, I would definitely have this at the top of my list because you can buy a really nice Igo C1 or 107 for around that price point. However, at this price point, you've got an issue, and the main one is corrosion. Now, they started on 2005 plate, and they went up to about 2013, but under a grand, you're going to be looking at old ones like this, so 05, 55, 06s, 56s, maybe an 07. They're going to have that, and they're probably going to have high mileage on them, excess of 100,000 miles. And at that sort of age and mileage, you'll find they'll have be corroded, particularly down here where the arch meets the back of the sill and the inner and outer sill. Very, very common. I've seen 58s and even 09 plates where they've corroded here. So it is common to see them on older cars like this one. And in fact, I'd probably say that it's guaranteed that cars of this age, of this of the iGos, will probably have been already been welded. Now, that's not a reason not to buy one, but you have to be able to make sure that it's not spread too far and that it's not imminently about to get, fail an MOT again when it's, it might be unviable to repair because eventually they'll corrode and when they get near the actual mounting point once they get to that point there it comes so expensive to repair them because the mounting point needs to be properly welded up and fabricated to fix it that it's just not worth doing and that's usually why you see a lot of these get of this age off the road it's not because the engines are blown up or they're uncommon or the engines are terrible and they fall apart far from it it's generally down to corrosion so you need to make sure you get your head underneath checking these sills and back, back arches make sure you've got no rot there also, as well, check the front subframes. They can go at this sort of era as well. But if you can find a good one for under a grand, honestly, guys, buy one because they are superb cars and they do offer really cheap motoring. If you can't afford to insure one of these, then you're pretty much on a bicycle. Other things to watch out for on the Igo C1 and 107s is water in the boot. It usually comes from the stop lamp here at the top. They get water ingress in there. I have seen the odd seal go as well around the top of the bootlet itself. So just be careful. Check, the, check your seals on the back of it and make sure it's all dry in the boot. Clutches on these are quite common for going as well. You have to bear that in mind. Every sort of 30, 40,000 miles, it doesn't matter what quality of clutch you put in either, guys. They always just seem to go. Uh, you have to bear that in mind. So make sure you're getting the car started up. You've got a really high clutch pedal. Uh, go and try and put it in high gear and sort of accelerate, particularly up a hill. Make sure it's not slipping. If it is, it's not the end of the world or it's very high. It's not the end of the world to replace. A few hundred pounds will put it right. They're quite cheap to do. You can pick clutches up for these for about 50 quid. Uh, and they're about three or four hours to do. Actually, one of the easiest clutches you can fit currently at the moment in the car game. Other things quickly, the interior handles can come off on the driver's side door. That can be quite common. And also make sure that the heaters work inside the cab. So make sure it's working on all the settings. Because if it goes down and you need a new heater motor, you've got to rip the dash out. And it's a pain in the ass to do. 
You could look at a Peugeot 206, uh, probably the argu arguably probably the last decent Peugeot that was ever made. The 306 and 206s were very good cars. Now, you're not going to get any 306s now. They're pretty much all gone because they were an absolute superb car. But the 206 was not a bad car either. They ran from about S Reg to 2008. To be honest with you, at this sort of price point, we're going to be looking at sort of 05, 06, 07s. They did sort of facelift them on the 06 onwards, did some quirky colours and stuff like that, and they're just better spec. Uh, if you can try and find a late one, that's probably the one I would go for. But this one's not bad. I mean, it's a fair price for a fair car. 1.48 valve petrols. You've got a couple of engine choices. You've got the 1.1, the 1.4. These are called TU engines. Been in the Citroëns and Peugeots pff, since the 80s. Very good, little capable engine. Pretty reliable. Five-speed manuals. Okay on fuel, I'd say. Like I said, they're half-decent, reliable things. Can suffer with oil leaks. Check down the side of the engines, particularly on the cam side. Uh, they, can, they, can leak. they can leak from the side of the cylinder heads as well. It's been known to. Rocker boxes can leak as well. That's very common. But it is very rare they ever go wrong. 206s themselves, corrosion-wise, aren't that bad. If they do corrode, it's usually on the back of the sills here. I've seen a few go like that. But generally, over the rest of the car, you don't, you don't, you very rare you'll find any sort of general corrosion. But you don't, you're not going to find with rusty wings or arches or quarters going funny. Just because the protection they use on Peugeot's from the factories of this era was absolutely superb. So they're not really renowned for being rock boxes. MOT-wise, I used to see a few of them come in with dodgy wishbone arms. They were always common for going on them. Um, ball joints in particular. Stupid design where basically the ball joint was built into the wishbone arm. So you just couldn't change the ball joint. You had to buy an entire arm, which is really expensive. They've come down a lot now. You can buy a set of arms probably on eBay for about 60 quid. So not the end of the world pretty easy to change the main thing you want to be checking on these is the rear axles the axles on these are torsion bar suspension so it's quite an old school suspension system first using the Peugeot 205 uh, but they can go wrong and turn, they can actually break internally uh, and cause the wheels to sort of splay out particularly the driver's side rear is the most common for doing it so basically get yourself at the back of the car like this look at it step back and make sure you can see the and make sure you're looking at the back wheels and make sure they look straight if you start to see one of them sort of angled out slightly splayed i'll put you a picture up to show you what i mean then you need to be keeping well away from it because you don't want to be putting an axle on a car this age they can be fixed you can replace the axles you can even buy kits that replace them as well but to be honest with you you know you don't really want to be going down that route you can avoid it if you have to go down that route it's going to be a fair few hundred pounds to put right however that said, they are reliable, they are practical, they did drive reasonably well, and you have to ask yourself why you see so many 206s still on the road, including older y Reg ones still going strong, and it's simply because they've got decent engines in them, they don't rock that bad, and they're just generally reliable, that's why there's so many of them about. You could have a look at a Vauxhall Mariva, however, i am be honest with you, I'd probably keep away from it, I know it's basically just based on a course of C, but... I just don't think it's worth bothering with. If you want to get a car that size, I'd say go for a Ford Fusion. That would be a better example. The Ford Fusion is just a Ford Fiesta. So as we talked about before, same problems on a Ford Fiesta you'll get on a Ford Fusion. But I think the Fusion's a boring, better, practical, sort of mini MPV, if you want to call it that. I'd keep away from the Mariva. Or alternatively, the Panda. I'd go for a Panda or a Fusion over a Mariva any day of the week. Now, you could look at a late Clio. Um, now, we looked at the other Clio before, the, but this is the later shape. This is Clio 3. Started on 2006. Now, this is 2006 model. They actually sold both the two Clios together, the old shape and the new shape, for about two years after this model came out. Again, very safe car. Brilliant safety record on them. Engines are pretty much the same. 1.2, 1.4 petrols. This is a 1.4. Don't really matter which one you buy. Five-speed manual. They drive really nice. In fact, I'd argue you could even argue and say that this is actually more drives better than the previous shape. It's a little bit more spacious inside. It's not as compact. It's not as claustrophobic. It's just to be a slightly bigger car. And they actually quite and they still look quite nice and modern. They're not too bad on MOTs. They're not really rock boxes or anything like that. However, they do suffer from one form of corrosion, which is on the front. So on the front of the car here, they've got like a supporting panel that holds the radiator on. It actually bolts to the front subframe. Um, and it can be mistaken for being the subframe. It actually isn't the subframe, but it looks like it because it's a part that's attached to it. It can corrode and look absolutely horrible to the point where the front of the radiators can actually fall out of the car. Now, believe it or not, it's not actually an MOT fail because it's not a structural item. It's not part of the subframe. But obviously, if you found one like that, you would want to get it rectified. You can pick these up for a very little money. They're easy available. Very common for doing and not too difficult to change. But other than that, really, they're not that bad. I've seen the odd... Obviously, these are Renaults. You're going to have a few electric quirks, back light problems like the previous model. can be a bit iffy. The windows can pack up. But other than that, really, they're generally all right. And I actually think they're a nice, decent, attractive car and well worth considering. 
Another car for definitely on the list would be the Toyota Yaris. Now, this is the Phase 1 Toyota Yaris. Ran from about 2000, I think they ran from, to 2006. Engine-wise, you'd be looking at a 1.0-litre petrol and a 1.3 petrol. They did do a diesel, but you're probably unlikely to find one of them. And to be honest with you, there's no real benefit in it. I would just go for the petrols. Be a little bit wary of very early models, so sort of 2000, 2001 plates, because some of them didn't have power steering as standard. So I'll be looking at something like this, an 0304 model. Now, there's a reason why there's a lot of these still around, is because they are super reliable. Engines are very good in them. I've seen them with big, big miles on, still going strong. In fact, this one's on 133,000 miles, and I bet you it drives like new. Now, the interior is a little bit dated, but bear in mind, this is a car that was designed in the late 90s. MOT-wise, they're not too bad on corrosion. I've seen the odd one with a bit of corrosion here and there, but they're not that bad, which is the reason why there's so many of them still around. A car that will stand up to corrosion and also has got a decent engine is probably going to last a fair old few years, especially if it's something practical like a Yaris. The parts are still readily available for these. Not many, you can still get all the bits for them. They're cheap to run, and it will offer you decent motoring. Now, if you are going to buy a Mark 1 Yaris, bear in mind some of these are going to be near 20 years of age. So just be popping your head under. Again, just check the back of the car in particular, looking for corrosion where the axle is, particularly where the mounting points are. That's where it bolts to the body. That's all really you can do, really. Just check them underneath, because that's going to be your biggest worry of the car this sort of era, is corrosion. But if you find a good one, they will definitely give you years of good service, and there's no reason you couldn't buy that and run that for a couple of years without too many issues. Other things mechanically, I did see the odd, they used to get the odd ones with sort of manifold problems where they'd leak. So you can either get leaky gaskets on the manifold or the crack itself, the manifold. But the parts are readily available for them. They also used to suffer with a bit of a problem where they bogged down, they were underpowered, or maybe have a misfire. Uh, math sensors in particular, they were quite common for going on them from memory. Uh, we used to change a lot of them. That was pretty much it, really. They didn't really give much issues other than that. The odd chain, maybe, if you see rattling, uh, or maybe stretch, then you'd have a bit of misfire going on there. That did happen from time to time, but it was really quite rare. But to be honest with you, overall, they are a really decent, reliable package, and definitely will be on my list of worth considering as a cheap, reliable car under the £1,000, even though it is getting on to near 20 years of age. You could also look at a Nissan Micra, I maybe mean, not this one, this under 204,000 miles, but then again, that just shows how reliable the engines are. You can pick Micras up for less than £1,000 all day long. They ran from 2002 to about 2009, I think they ran to. You're going to be looking at sort of like cars of this era, sort of 54, 05, 06, or high mileage versions, maybe like an 07 here, with big miles on. I'd probably try and get something around the 110, 120,000 mile mark, but I've seen these, like I said, with 200 foul on still going strong. They can suffer with noisy chains and they're a bit of a pain to do. You have to take the engine out to effectively fit them, a new chain on them. You can do it in situ, but it's a bit of a ball ache. To be honest, it's just easier to take the engine out. So you want to be starting it up, make sure you've got no rattles or anything like that, no noises when you turn the car off, any rattling at all of the chain, just keep well away from it. Also as well, check the steering. They have electric steering on these models. Uh, so you check, start the car up, turn it left, turn it right, make sure you've got the steering functioning, take it down the road and go for a proper test drive in it. But if you find a good one, they'll last for years, they'll give you good motoring, and there's a reason why there's so many of these about, guys, where you see your local takeaway handler off driving around in them, and not being stereotyped or anything like that. It's the reason being is because they're a practical, decent, cheap, reliable car, and ideal for the job. Now, a car to keep away from on the list, the Ford KA, 1.3 petrols. They were all 1.3 petrols, guys, with the exception of the Sport KA, which was a 1.6, which we're not going to cover in this video. Um, needless to say, the 1.3 KA... Of this era ran from oh, started in 1995 i think they started on about uh p reg or m reg they started on and ran up to 2008 9 i think 58 plates for the last one i've ever seen you're going to be looking at sort of anything from sort of 06 to 08 plate 58 last of the a few years of the run the reason for that is you won't find many one many of them earlier than that is because they've all rotten away they are terrible for corrosion they actually drive all right i don't slate them at all on the drivability the engines are quite old-fashioned but they do the job the engines were modified in about 2003 so updated slightly uh, made, but they never updated anything else really on them they still suffer with really bad corrosion and they corrode everywhere uh, around the fuel caps on the inside of the arch they go there sills all over the sills the front mounting points are where the subframe mounts actually to the body they can grow there once they've gone there it's pretty much game over floor pans can rot it's everywhere guys they just are really bad for corrosion and don't think buying a low mileage one will save you i've seen these with 30,000 miles come in and needed welding 
It's a shame really because they actually were a half decent car, but they are quite old. The corrosion's a real issue, and if you buy one, you'll be constantly having it welded every single year, and it'll be costing your fortune to run to the point you'll just give up with it and move on to something else. So there's definitely better cars out there for under a grand. You could look at a Mitsubishi Colt, but my experience with them is the parts are quite expensive, so maybe not. They don't drive that bad, but I don't know, the part situation scares me because they're not readily available as you would like them to be. Suzuki Ignis, again, you've got the Ignis or maybe even an Alto. They could be looked at potentially as a good car. They are very cheap, built to a price point, very reliable. They do rot occasion, on occasion, but they're not that bad. But they are very cheaply made. Uh, some of the parts can be a little bit tricky to get hold of, particularly some sensors, ABS sensors. I've had a few problems with them. CV joints in the past as well, they can be quite problematic. Engine mounts in particular. Trying to get engine mounts for these Suzuki Altos and Ignis is a pain in the ass. I've done, I've done a few of these over the last couple of years and it's just been a nightmare trying to locate parts for them. But they do drive well and they will do the mileage. I mean, this one's on 132,000 miles. I've seen a few Ignises with decent mileages on. This 1.3 engine, by the way, was in the Suzuki Jimmy. It's actually a decent engine, to be fair. In the Alto, it'll be a 1 litre, which is a slightly smaller version than this. The Ignis is actually, I don't know, I have a soft spot for the Ignis because it's quite a practical little mini sort of car, almost like a mini estate. And they always came in decent colours, but the parts can be a bit problematic. You could look at a earlier Micra. Now, they ran these from, what, 1993, I think, El Reg they started them on, uh, all the way up to 2002. Now, they actually were a superb car. Um, very reliable, 1 litre petrol. They also did a 1.3 as well. Most of them were 1 litres. Drove really well. Most of them probably won't have power steering, although they did have some power steering models. Very simple A to B sort of driving. However, they do suffer with corrosion. Uh, really bad. Sills in particular, inner arches, you just, that's what you're just going to find on a car of this year. But if you can find a good one that's half right, then maybe worth considering. Okay, so that is my choice of vehicles that I would pick for under £1,000 in the small car category. Uh, so let me know your thoughts on what you've seen. Have you owned any of these cars? Let me know in your comments below. If you think I've missed any vehicles out, let me know and I'll uh, get back to you and have a good my opinion on them in the comments. Uh, also, let me know on these types of videos if you like them or not. Would you like me to do more of them and expand them slightly? Maybe look at different sort of sectors, the medium sector, the large sector, up the budgets as well. well who knows where we can go with it. Thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.